All right, I will get started. Welcome everyone to another edition of Reader Meet Writer. This event is sponsored by the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, and we want to thank our partners at the New Atlantic Booksellers Association for supporting this event and inviting all of their stores. Uh, the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance is an organization that represents just under 700 independently owned bookstores throughout the Southeast. And we have been doing these events and I am your host for these events. My name is Wiley Cash. I'm the New York Times bestselling author of novels like Ghosts Come Home, which will be out in September. We've been doing these events since the beginning of the pandemic. And normally uh, a writer like Cheryl would be in a bookstore near you, but she can't be. Well, first of all, she's in Rome. Second of all, we're still recovering from, from COVID. And so we're bringing these events to you the best way that we can. Y'all have given us just incredible support and I wanna keep it going. Um, independent bookstores are the lifeblood of our literary community and your support of them means everything. So if you like what you hear tonight about Cheryl's book, if you haven't purchased it yet, please do so uh, by purchasing it from the bookstore that brought you here to this event tonight. Maybe you saw it on somebody's Facebook page or a store's newsletter. Please reward that business by purchasing the book from them. Also, if you have any questions tonight, um, after Cheryl and I talk for a bit, go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your page and ask your question there, and I will make sure that Cheryl gets uh, asked your question. Make sure to include your name and the name of your home independent bookstore. Um, I want to share with you an event we have coming up next week. We are hosting Shannon Dingle with her new memoir, Living Brave, Lessons from Hurt, Lighting the Way to Hope. That will be Thursday next week, July 8th at 7 p.m. And something kind of interesting, I will be broadcasting that event live from the North Carolina Literary Hall of Fame at the Weymouth Center um, in Southern Pines, North Carolina. So if you want to get on a little early, maybe 645, I'll take a moment and show you around the Literary Hall of Fame. It's inside this um, incredibly beautiful yet creepy old mansion in uh, the Sand Hills of North Carolina called the Weymouth Center. So please join us for that as well in, in advance of Shannon's event at 7 p.m. But tonight we are here with Cheryl Diamond to discuss her new memoir, Nowhere Girl. The book just came out. It's getting incredible reviews. I read it. It is, today I caught it, pulse pounding, heartbreaking, um, breathtaking. It is all of those things. You know, I teach fiction um, most often to undergraduates. And if a student came to me with this written as fiction, I would say this is not realistic. This is unbelievable. This is too much. But written as a memoir, it is staggering. It is overwhelming how wonderful and um, terrifying and brilliant this book is. And so I'm thrilled that Cheryl's with us tonight. She is a former outlaw, a full-time dreamer and author of three books. She grew up on the run from Interpol, transitioned into high fashion modeling in New York. And her first book, Model, a memoir, was published at the age of 21. Her second book, Naked Rome, reveals the most intriguing people in the eternal city and their hidden stories. She is joining us tonight from Rome. Her new book, Nowhere Girl, the harrowing true story of her lawless childhood has just been released and she joins us tonight. Cheryl, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure, I'm really glad to be here. Well, can you tell us uh, at the top of our show a little bit about Nowhere Girl? Well, Nowhere Girl is, took me 10 years to write. And the reason for that is because it's a very epic and complex story which I'm sure you know, having read it now. And it was a very big challenge for me to find a way to condense something so complex into just 300 pages. The first draft was actually 800. So you can imagine what the editing process was like. And it's basically the story of what it's like to be born into a family of fugitives who were already on the run from Interpol and various other law enforcement agencies even before I was born and how the decisions of your parents and your family can affect you so deeply even before you even got your start. So it's a lot about finding your identity when you've had your identity burned hundreds of times and when you've had to start over and leave everything behind. 
So at first, when I was a little kid, I remember I thought it was some kind of big adventure, the changing the names and the fact that I was given a new backstory in each city and that it was like a game. We almost had to stay one step ahead of these shadowy people who were chasing us. But as I got older, I realized how much danger we were in and I realized we were being hunted. And then as I got even older, I realized that the most dangerous people were not so much the people hunting us, but my own family. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that there at the end about the most dangerous people might, being, might be the ones that were inside of your own family. And you, you mentioned a moment ago about kind of burning through these identities every time you would, you would, you would move somewhere, your, your parents, primarily your father would brief mm -hmm. you you know, what's your name now? Where are we from? You know, all the way in. And he would throw these trick questions at you. And sometimes you would, he would ask you what your, what your real name is. And what, in one instance you said, what, what's that? When he, when he brings up your, your, yes. your, your, your birth name. Um, so I wonder about as your identities are burned off, as you move from South Africa to Virginia, to, you know, Canada and all these different places across the globe, what happens to your identity as an individual? Can you talk about that as these fictitious identities are burned off? How do you become someone? I think it can go one of two ways. And that depends perhaps on the person's nature. I think either it can completely scramble your sense of identity and who you are, or it reinforces it. Because if you've had your name burned and you have to constantly be somewhere new and you have nothing else to rely on, you do, in my case, I felt I had to go into myself and really figure out who I was and find some sort of core or some sort of strength within myself. Because otherwise, and I saw in the case of my siblings that it had the effect of scrambling them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I want to talk about them in a moment, but before we do, I want to talk about the opening pages and this harrowing adventure that opens the book. It's the trip to the Golden Temple or where you eventually arrive at the Golden Temple. Your family's in India. They've taken on this new identity, this new religion. They're strangers in a, in a, in a foreign land. You, you know, you and your father especially stand out. Um, for reasons that we might find out down the road. Um, there's a car crash, there's armed assailants, there's all of these things. Why did you choose to open the book with that memory and that, that insight into that trip specifically? Because it's my first memory. It's my first very vivid, clear memory. And I think India stuck with me in my heart also in a very profound way and a very clear way because I was only four years old at the time, but I remember, I have a photographic memory. So I remember things in pictures and the feelings mm -hmm. and India stuck with me because it was, there were a lot of terrible and destructive things in my childhood, but there was magic there as well. And that was a particular point where there was still magic within my family. And in writing this book, I wanted to make sure to be as honest as possible and not make it a book about poor me, but make it a book about family and about the fact that you can change your destiny, even if it is a very harsh one. So I tried to put myself into the shoes also of the people who did me harm, different members of my family, and also write from their perspectives. Because in the end, it's not a story just about me. It's a story about this entire family and the challenges that we had and uh, how the lies eventually caught up and destroyed us, destroyed the family. Sure, and, well, and yeah. in those opening pages, the trip to the Golden Temple, there, is a, there are a couple of days of reprieve where you're um, around a hotel, you're around a pool, and there's, a, there's yeah. different things going on, and there is some serious tension, if not outright hatred, between your older brother and your older sister, who's the oldest. And that is a dynamic, even early on, four, five, six years old, 
you know, you feel, you're aware of. They're, you know, they're they're triangulating. They're he there, there's a moment where he tries to uh, your brother, somebody approaches your sister with marriage and she's 16 and your brother says, oh, this is perfect. We can just leave her. Right. This is mm-hmm. the answer. This is this is perfect. You grow a little bit older and, and, and more more tensions in the family reveal themselves, namely tensions between your mother and father. Can you talk about those dynamics as much as you would like without giving anything away in, in, the, in the narrative itself and how from a very early age you you learned how to navigate these dynamics. Yes, I think it's often the youngest child in those difficult family situations who becomes hypersensitive to other people's emotions. And even today, I can feel what other people feel, which can be overwhelming sometimes because it can be very helpful because it, it lends you an empathy, but it can also be a lot to take on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so from a young age, I was aware that there was something wrong. I knew there was something off. And I do remember worrying about that dynamic between my brother and sister. Because even though they were 10 and 12 years older than me, I felt like it had a life of its own, that that dynamic between them was gonna careen out of control. And for the tension between my parents, that I observed very much because I've always felt very protective of my mother. Mm-hmm. And she's, she's a very pure soul. And it's like she didn't fit in with the, the chaos and the horror that was going on around us. And so from a very young age, I decided, I remember deciding when I was about six or seven that I have to save her, which is a very strange thought for a kid to have at that age Mm -hmm. but considering our circumstances it made sense and um, that was something that drove me a lot in my life and in positive and difficult ways that I felt that responsibility and um, I think it was a catalyst for a lot of the things I did certainly for the the first book I wrote because I wanted to have enough money and to help us and to get us out. And writing was always something I was passionate about. So that feeling that love was something that drove me very strongly. And the, I knew I had to get her away, even though I still loved my father. And I somehow very deep down had that inside of me, I've got to save her. So I knew how bad it was even. And can we talk just for a moment of, about your first book, primarily the writing of it? I believe you were 21 when it came out. And here you are. You've, you've been scouted. You've been kind of pulled into, the, into modeling, into the fashion industry at a very young age without really trying, to be honest, to be part of that world. You're living in New York City. And you publish this book at 21 years of age, which is a, it's, a, it's like an insider's memoir of the modeling business and, and, and all the expectations and burdens and excitement and behind the scenes of that. But at the time, you're also trying to support your parents. I think you're paying for two different apartments, I think, or you're paying for them to be separated at some point, if I'm not mistaken, forgive me if I am. And you're, 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 you're shouldering this incredible burden. In the meanwhile, you're doing all of this under an assumed identity. You start an LLC with a friend or an acquaintance to launder the book money that you access with an ATM card. I mean, how did you do all of this? Well, I wasn't laundering the money. That was not, not laundering it, but, but trying to access it in like a surprising way. How did I manage it? It was extremely stressful and difficult. It's a lot to have on the shoulders of a teenager. I was 17 when I started writing the book and I had no formal schooling I, because I never went to school. I was just, and the schooling in my family stopped at the age of 13. So I mostly taught myself through reading. And then I discovered that I liked writing and I wanted very much to write something about the modeling industry because it was something people were so curious about and yet had no idea the challenges that are actually within it. So how I, I remember that I did nothing but work. I would work as a model during the day and then I would write uh, the book at night. 
and um, how I juggled it. I juggled it for four years until the book came out when I was 21. And then I became very ill with uh, autoimmune disorder. And I won't give too much of that away because it's in the book, but the basic thing is I realized you can't run forever. Mm -hmm. And the emotional toll caught up with me. And the ways in which your family was relying on you, your parents, especially after that book in some of the situations and pressures they put on you are staggering. And um, I won't give those away either, but it's, it's amazing. Um, just some of the things that, that you heard that were said to you. Um, but I wanna talk about the way you structured the book. And I, I, in the early pages, I thought, I thought how smart it was that you never grounded the reader in the knowledge that you have now as the writer, right? What you do is you, and you open the book when you're four, and then we go almost by the age and the location at which the memory comes. And it's only when you, the, the, the character in the memoir, you, learns the background information on your parents that your reader learns the background information on your parents and why all of this is happening, why, why they've been on the run, how they've stayed on the run, what they're running from. And I thought that was such a brilliant way to give the reader insight into your state of mind. There's, there's a part in the novel, in the, in, the, in the memoir, where you're, I can't remember exactly where you are, but there are clouds or fog that are very disorienting. And I thought, my God, that's how, that's how much of her life must have felt like, because that's often how I felt reading the book. Can you talk a little bit about the choices you made? This is told present tense. So we're learning the information when you're learning the information. Can you talk about the choices you made in terms of how you structured the book in terms of its narrative? Mm -hmm. I decided that I wanted it to be as true to the way it felt as possible. And so I thought, how can I make that, how can I transmit that feeling most accurately to the reader? And so I decided to do it chronologically in and in present tense so that it feels like everything is happening with the same immediacy that it felt to me at the time. And the choice to reveal things to the reader exactly as they were revealed to me at the same time, at the same age. It's because I wanted it to be like, we are on, we're in this together and we're discovering it together. Rather than there's someone much older looking back and telling people how it was. Because a lot of the, I think the suspense and the, the thrill and also the emotion of a book is present when you feel like you're there with the character and that you're living things together. So I wanted almost to take the reader on the journey with me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I made those, uh, those editorial and structure choices. Which is so fascinating because in that early memory, the trip to the Golden Temple where you eventually arrive at the Golden Temple, you get into uh, by you know for all purposes of car accident and you and the, and the car is fixed by a young boy in a village there's there's men with guns your your family barely escapes um and all of these terrifying things happen that as a father you know i have kids who are six and five i think oh my god i would just curl up in a ball and cry if any of those things happened to me and they happen in quick succession in those early pages but you know you as a young child sees it all as a huge adventure and you're never afraid because your mom and dad are with you and they're telling you not to be afraid, especially your dad. But then by the end of the book or toward the end of the book, simple conversations with your father in public, just on an emotional level are so terrifying and so revealing and so vulnerable in a way that I never felt when there were men with guns and car accidents. Can you talk about 
kind of raising the emotional intensity in the book as you become aware um, living through all of these things where you arrive at these truly finely wrought and portrayed terrifying moments of interpersonal relationships with your family. I think the men with guns were never as frightening to me because that was a threat that came from the outside. And it was something that I thought we were facing together as a family. And I loved them very much. So for me, I, I was unafraid because I thought, well, we'll all stand together and we'll deal with this. And then as time went on, the thing, the reason it became so terrifying is I realized the people I thought were on my side aren't. And that maybe the biggest con was perpetrated on me, sure. not on the outsiders. So even though both situations and there's many outside threats during the book, especially with Interpol chasing us, especially with the other law enforcement agencies that were after my parents. But I remember as a kid, I didn't care about any of that because I thought, well, I'll do anything for them. So we'd figure it out together. And, um, but yeah, the, so those things never left a mark on me. And, but of course, when you when you look at your own father and you realize ah so all these years was that real was it not and it's also in the book it's it's a lot about trying to make peace with the fact that sometimes the people you love don't aren't the people you hope for mm -hmm. that they can't be for whatever reason sure and trying to find the strength inside to walk away into a world because they were the only people I had. So I had no friends or outside um, reference for what could be out there. It was the outside world to me was a scary thing. And so it took a lot to face the decision of, am I going to be the person that they expect me to be, or am I going to be me? Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to, I think, in everyone's life is yeah. whether, because even though my story is ex very unusual and extraordinary, there it's still a choice we all face in, we have to at some point in our life, figure out who we are and then either stand for it or not, no matter the circumstances. Um, I wanna let everybody know to ask if you have questions for Cheryl about anything we've said or any questions you might have about the book or her story or writing the book, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question in, mention your name and the name of your home bookstore. Um, I've got a couple more, more questions. You mentioned friends a moment ago, Cheryl, and I recalled the heartbreaking story of, I believe you're 10 years old and you meet a little boy. I think he's from the UK, he's 12. Mm -hmm. and you go to bed after meeting him with this kind of unfamiliar, uncertain mindset and this weight on your heart of, oh my God, is this a friend? Is this a friendship? What's going to happen? And then the day he's leaving, he says, well, give me your address. I'll write you a letter. Can you talk about that moment and just kind of extrapolate from that the difficulties that you referenced earlier about friendship and connections. I, I wanted to highlight that moment in the book because it was important to me. It was the moment I realized that I was not allowed to connect with the outside world or to have any lasting connection with it and that I would always be the person who was just passing through. And uh, it hammered it home in that sense because he was also a kid who had an unusual family and a father who was a bit of an outlaw. So we understood each other. And it was the first time I'd met someone my age who was of a similar kind of strange maturity level for, for that age. And so we, we liked each other very much. And, but they weren't as big outlaws as, as we were. And so he thought that we could stay in touch, but I knew that any postmark or any telephone number was going to leave a trail and I would never be allowed to do that. And I was forced to lie to him 
mm-hmm. about staying in touch. And I do remember that it had a big impact on me because I realized it's always going to be a life of lies. And it was at about the age of 10 that I realized that was not a life that agreed with who I am. Mm -hmm. But I could not see any way out because it felt like a betrayal of my family to go against it. And so you're caught between love and the desire for freedom. You're caught between the feeling of duty to your family and the need to be yourself. And that was the battle that would really come to the fore when I grew up and became about 20, 21. And I realized I had to take action or it was going to take me down. Sure. And you, you mentioned uh, a moment ago, you know, a life of lies, finding a way out. There is a, a scene which is presented almost comically because it's so surreal. There are several moments. There's a moment where you say, um, my mom was un- my mom was uncomfortable with certain things, but she was always okay with us being around men with guns or hanging out with the Japanese mafia. You say it's there, there are several lighthearted things like that that point at just how absurd all of this is for a child, for anyone, much less a child of this age, to be brought into this. But there's a moment where you write um, uh, about a few weeks after your first normal teenage party, your father shows you a secret bag with $10,000 in cash and $5,000 in gold coins. And there's also your passports and your birth certificates. What is a moment like that like to be for a, for a teenager who's just trying to be normal? It's a tremendous weight. It's a tremendous responsibility because he said to me, you're the one I can trust because I was always very collected under pressure. Um, And so that was why I was the only one that he showed the escape bag to in case anyone found us. I was supposed to get it and then run and find the family at our appointed meeting place. So it was... In, at the age of 13, it was my job to save us. And um, that's a lot on a child. It was a lot. And speaking of a lot on a child, um, there's a moment when something horrible occurs between you and your older brother, Frank, and you write, Frank appears normal, so I guess I must as well. Nothing has happened. I must believe that. Must repeat it until it becomes true. And later you write, I think it's about your father, My anger never seems to rest on anyone else for long. It circles back to the girl in the mirror. Um, Can you talk about the ways in which you bore these incredible burdens for all of these people who didn't deserve your dedication to them? Yes. That was something I carried for a long time because after uh, I managed to break free or thought I had broken free, I realized that I was still carrying that weight of feeling responsible for everything that happened, which is very absurd, but it's a common psychological thing that children who go through abuse or difficult childhoods feel themselves responsible rather than realizing that it, it's, it was the responsibility of the adults, of course. Because when adults are irresponsible, somebody has to be irresponsible. And so one of the kids will step forward and become the parent in the situation. And that was me in this, in this family dynamic. That's, that was my role, or the role, I assume. And um, it was very difficult to let go of that anger. But I knew I had to, and that was one of the main reasons I wrote Nowhere Girl also, because it was a story that just haunted me. It, it, it kept me up at night. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't unravel it. And I didn't understand where it all went wrong or why we stopped loving each other. And so when I was 24, it was one of the darkest times in my life. I was completely without identity, passport, nowhere to go. And I decided, all right. I'm even, and it was also a bit of a, it was a dangerous story for me to write because these people are still out there. And I don't know where my father is right now and I don't know. So to 
write the story was something a lot of friends were concerned about as well. But I remember just one day I decided, no, I'm going to do it because I think these cycles of abuse go on for generations in families. And, and for certain in my family, I saw how that existed in my grandfather's family and my grandmother's side as well. And then they put it on to my mother and then my mother chose a man like my father. And then this was visited on us kids. And at some point, like you, I stopped looking around for anyone to save me and realize sometimes you just realize you're the only man for the job and that you have to, it has to be you to do that. So breaking that cycle and trying to write my way out of the confusion and the anger and to almost rewrite my future was what I wanted to do with Nowhere Girl, to, to find a way to understand it. And that you said that everything went chronologically in the book. Well, also as I was writing the book, I was understanding. So it's, it's accurate in the sense also that I was coming to these realizations as I was writing. It's not like I knew how I wanted to write Nowhere Girl and then I wrote it. I had mm -hmm. no idea what kind of a book it was gonna be. It felt like a primal scream needed to come out of me. And, and then I didn't end up writing it that way at all. There's some, especially the beginning is written, is very magical, but it's written during the darkest time of my life when I was also, I thought I might die from the illness I had yeah. from the stress. So, and that's something I have to say that now it makes me proud that there's, there's a lot of ways you can approach a story like mine and a lot of, different emotions you can write from but I wanted to I wanted to say that for also people who've been through abuse and difficult childhoods and all that that yes it happened but it doesn't have to shape the rest of your life I really truly believe that destiny is something we can change that we can because we're the authors of our story in the end all of us whether you write it or you don't we are the authors of our story and I think that we can we can also find family in the people we that sometimes our friends understand and love us way more than our families ever did in some cases. Sure. And so you, that's the great thing about being an adult is you get to choose your family. Yeah. And I like what you said earlier about, you know, understanding these cycles of generational trauma and how your mother chose a man very much like her father. And, I think that often, you know, my wife and I talk about this quite often between the two of us. I think oftentimes doing what exactly what you did, which is putting a name to the trauma and unwinding the trauma, either in your mind or on the page, is already doing more to assess it and deal with it and correct it as much as we ever can than the previous generation was capable or willing to do. And this book is a testament, I think, to bravery, but also your insight and, and, and your willingness to, to do just that. And, and we have some questions coming in from, from folks who are watching, but I want to ask you, and I want to encourage folks, if you have a question, try to slip it in real quick. How did you settle on Rome? Why Rome? Of all the places you've been, Many of them breathtaking, not to mention North Carolina, <laughs> where I live in North Carolina. That's where it's at. <laughs> That's where it's at. But how did you settle on Rome? I came to Rome just for a few days. And, and it felt something like home. And I can't explain exactly why. Perhaps because of the, I think it might have something to do with the tremendous history of the city. And the fact that everything has happened here at some time and somehow the city has survived, somehow it went on. And I think that gave me hope at a time in my life when I didn't feel much of that. And also the incredible beauty of Rome. Like you really, when you walk around Rome, you're walking in beauty. Mm. And I had lost my belief in that for sure. And yet it's something very important to me because I'm quite a artistic, sensitive soul in the end. So to, to be able to go around and to be surrounded by that and that feeling of warmth and absolute loveliness, 
it did so much good to my soul, even for those few days that I thought I want to try and find, see if I can find a way to actually live here. Because I thought, I also thought the Italians and their way of enjoying the moment would do me good. So that was the, the reason behind the choice. And I'm very glad I made it. Well, I'm envious. I'm envious of you. Uh, we have a question from KC. KC asks, for many people who suffer trauma, their past memories are often spotty. Um, but could, would you, or could you talk about the possibility that maybe the trauma you experienced may have sharpened your memory or sharpened your powers of observation? You talked earlier about how you feel that you're an intuitive person. Do you feel like the experience that you've had has sharpened your lens, your memory, your perception? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, because it made me become extremely aware of my surroundings, of other people's emotions, and of myself. And it was very interesting. I did therapy, actually, with a very renowned uh, neuropsychologist. And he did something very interesting. He scanned my brain. And the most interesting finding he had was that my memory center was not, was completely like a normal person. And there were signs of PTSD in other areas, but that center was, and normally people, it's completely black in people who have gone through what I've gone through. And he said, oh, that's why you made it. Hmm. And that was a very interesting moment for me because I said, what do you mean? And he says, because you never shut you down. Oh, wow. That's and that was a very beautiful emotional moment and then I understood ah I think that was it that was the difference because I often wondered why was I able to survive and the others couldn't and I think it was because somehow through it I held on to some spark of me inside like coming back to the question of identity I somehow felt I knew deep down what I would do what I wouldn't and I knew the difference between right from wrong. Mm -hmm. So when he said that, I thought, ah, okay. Yeah, I never quite let go of who I was when I was four and when I still believed in everything. Sure. And that's a very powerful thing. Often people will call that naivete in a child or in young people. They'll say, oh, they believe anything is possible or they believe that they can make it through and that's naivete. But I think that's our greatest strength. Yeah. That hope. Yeah. You sure. can conquer almost any, anything if you believe like that. Um, Susan asks, how did you come up with the title Nowhere Girl? Perhaps what does it mean if you could say a little bit thematically? So that was a title actually, the original title was Born on the Run. And then in a conversation with my agent, it's uh, Larry Weissman and Sasha Alper. And Sasha said, you know, I've been thinking and there's this title that keeps coming back into my mind that I think would represent the story very well. And it was her idea, Nowhere Girl. And I thought about it for a while and then I realized that she had a very good point because I did have that fit and it's true. I'm, when people ask me where I'm from, nowhere is the answer or everywhere is the answer. It's either Nowhere Girl or Everywhere Girl, depending <laughs> how you look at it. And um, now I'd say it's more everywhere or somewhere. And mm -hmm. but when I was young, I had a feeling of being completely, which was true, completely without a base or any solid foothold in the world. And I did have that feeling. And I was born a ghost because of the, the fact that they didn't put their real names on my birth certificate or my passport. I later found out that I was actually without an identity. So it's also a reference to the fact that I had to do a court case that went as high as the Supreme Court of Luxembourg in order to even establish my existence as a human being because of the fraud they committed before I was born. So yeah, it's, um, it's very much, a, Nowhere Girl is very much about a feeling I had of being a girl from me nowhere with no one yeah well i think that this is so corny but please indulge me i think we're going to be seeing nowhere girl everywhere 
Sorry, I'm sad. Um, I think this book will get a lot of attention, and I think <laughs> I think it'll speak to a lot of people who might not have been to the extreme circumstances that you've been through. But there are so many parts of this story that are going to resonate with so many people. And thank you so much for writing it, and thank you so much for sharing your time with us tonight, all the way from beautiful Rome. So thank you so much, Cheryl. I wish you all the best. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night.